SSH stands for Secure Shell, and you really don't need more than just the name to understand what it does. It's creating a shell on another machine remotely over the internet or over your local area connection or over some type of network, and it's doing this connection in a secure manner. Now, before SSH, there were other protocols to handle the remote connection part, like Telnet, for example. That worked fine as far as remote management and transferring data goes, but Telnet is sending all of its data in plain text. Now, this wasn't such a big deal for a while, like back when Telnet was first created in 1969. You usually weren't remoting into anything that was very far away. Like the typical remoting scenario back then is you would have a terminal, which basically is just a terminal, but like a physical one instead of a window like you see here. Uh, and this terminal doesn't have a whole lot of computer power. I mean, this is something that's small enough for a person to interact with directly back in the 60s and 70s. So this does, can't really do any heavy lifting. It can't really do any compiling. You would just send your code or whatever it was over to the mainframe, and that would be the size of an entire room, or sometimes it would be multiple rooms, and that would do the heavy lifting. That would do your compiling and all that type of stuff. So usually your remote connection is into a machine that's like one room away. Um, so there's not that many hops in between. There's not really a lot of possibility for somebody to be listening in on that connection. Uh, and this was obviously before the internet even existed. Now there were wide area networks uh, in use at that time, like there was ARPANET, but for the most part, that would have just been used by the United States Department of Defense. But by 1995, that's when SSH was created, um, and probably a few years before then, encrypted connections really started to become necessary because so many people were using the internet at that point and anybody could be sniffing traffic on any one of the networks between you and that remote client. And if they were, they could capture those packets to get your login credentials and details about whatever it is you're doing. So when you're using SSH and someone tries to capture the data, they'll only be able to see two IPs that are talking essentially. Uh, and depending on the size and the frequency of the data, maybe they'll be able to make some inferences. Like they can obviously see uh, how big the packets are. They can see how many of them are flowing through at once. So based on that, they might be able to guess what you're doing. But there's also some obfuscation that takes place with SSH in terms of the size of the data that's in there, which we'll cover in just a moment. But obviously this encryption would prevent an attacker from being able to get plain text information like usernames, credit card information, uh, and passwords. So this is the way that an SSH packet looks like. At the very beginning, you have the packet length, which is four bytes in size. And this is just describing what the length of the packet is going to be, um, not including the packet length segment itself. So then we have the padding length, which is one byte in size. And this is describing what the size or the length of the padding data is going to be. And this padding data is just essentially random nonsense that doesn't actually mean anything. It's just random bytes. Um, but this is going to be mixed in with the payload before it's encrypted. So this is what I was talking about where uh, this padding data, if your payload is really, really small, like let's say that your payload is maybe 16 bytes, it's kind of hard to tell exactly uh, exactly that this payload is 16 bytes because it's going to have the padding data mixed in with it. And then your payload, that's what actually contains what you're trying to send. So this payload would be things like pieces of a file. Uh, it could be an entire file if it's a really, really small one, but obviously if it's bigger, it's not gonna all be sent as one packet. Um, this could be a command. And certainly if you're getting responses back from a machine, especially if it's very verbose response, this will be pieces of that response. And so you just get the packets coming through one after another. And the SSH packets are obviously encrypted. Now the whole thing, isn't encrypted because that wouldn't work. So what you've got is 
uh, basically like this sandwich that you see here. So padding length, payload, and padding data is all connect is all encrypted. The padding length and the um, message authentication code is not. Uh, now, the reason that these beginning and end segments are not encrypted is because TCP is going to use them. Uh, TCP is going to use the packet length to obviously figure out how big the packet is that's coming. Um, like I, we talked about in the last video, TCP is going to handle the flow of the data from one point to another. So it needs to know how big it is. And then the message authentication code that's necessary to verify that this payload didn't get corrupted in any way. So it's essentially going to be a hash of your payload um, and it's going to be verified against it. So if, you know, random fluctuations in the environment could cause it to get corrupted, uh, obviously if someone's trying to tamper with the data in real time, it's going to get corrupted. The hash that's here inside the MAC is not going to match the hash of the payload. Now, on top of creating these encrypted packets, SSH also opens a series of channels for you to send the data over. And this allows you to multiplex multiple connections over it and also use SSH for things besides just a secure shell. Uh, so I mentioned transferring files over SSH. Uh, you could do that with secure copy. You can remotely edit files using SFTP. Uh, you can even tunnel HTTP traffic over SSH and sort of use it as a kind of VPN. Uh, if you wanted to access something that was behind a firewall, say a program that's behind the office's firewall, uh, you can also do that because of the SSH tunneling. Uh, so now we can actually see how SSH sets up our connection with a channel. So I'm going to connect to this local IP address here. Uh, and I'm going to use the verbose switch so that you'll be able to see uh, everything that comes out when we're connecting. All right, so we have this identify file. Um, so this has our private key for the encryption uh, of the connection. And we also have the local version, the local version string of OpenSSH. And then we have the remote version of SSH and then they're basically just checking with one another to make sure that they're compatible. So on my Gen 2 machine that you see here, I'm running a slightly newer version of OpenSSH. And so this is just so that they can figure out what features both of their applications are supporting, uh, what type of encryption they're going to use, um, what type of compression they're going to be used, so on and so forth. Um, so then if we scroll down a bit, we should see it uh, trying to authenticate as the remote user. Here you can see it's trying to authenticate to that IP address over port 22 as remote. So that's just the, uh, the username that's on the laptop that I'm logged in as. Uh, and then down here, we see that it's prompting for the password. So I should be able to just put that in. Oh, I think I typed it wrong. There we go. Oh wait, no, that didn't work. Uh, let's try that again. There we go. So now it's gonna tell us that the authentication succeeded. And if you were to connect, Without the V flag, this is basically all you would see, the prompt for the password and then authentication rece uh, received. And there's a little bit more information that uh, verbose mode gives us. Basically everything with the debug one is only printed with verbose mode. So we've got the channel. So you can see that it established channel zero. And there's also some environment variables that we're getting. So like the color of our terminal, you can see that that changed. Uh, Cause obviously this is a shell that's open on the other machine that I'm just able to see responses from. So like if I do a NeoFetch, for example, you can see that obviously it's Linux Mint cause I'm on a Linux Mint machine. But if I come over here and do it on the local machine, you can see I'm using Gen 2. Uh, so there you go. Now you know how SSH works. 
It's no longer just that magical remote shell thingy that makes the computer do the thing. Uh, you actually get it. Hope you found the video useful. Peace out.